Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 2017 Three Minute Thesis Competition Grand Final. Let me begin by acknowledging that we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people and we pay respect to their elders both past and present. And while we're doing that, we should probably also thank the Howard Florey Institute because we're in their lecture theatre, one of the best theatres on campus. This is the culmination of weeks and weeks of exciting planning, preparation, heats, seven heats involving 80 competitors. We're now whittled down to the final 10 who are all sitting nervously in front of me. Three Minute Thesis competition started at the University of Queensland. Reportedly, um, Professor Alan Lawson was standing in the shower. Now, Queensland was in the midst of a drought and the state government had given out three minute timers. So everyone had those little timers stuck on the shower. He turned the timer, watched the sand trickling through and had this idea that maybe he didn't have to read 80 or 90,000 words. Maybe he could just listen to three minutes, but a very accessible, exciting, dynamic three minutes. Queensland stayed their first competition. It was a huge success. Melbourne jumped in the year after. Very quickly, it spread throughout Australia, and the Trans-Tasman competition was born. Originally, the winner of the Trans-Tasman competition got to keep it, and so it went around the country from Queensland to UWA. Queensland thought it was far too good, a good, uh, good of a thing, and they took it back. It became the Asia-Pacific, so now it goes to Malaysia, it goes to Singapore, it goes around the region. Every year, it takes place in Queensland. U21 then jumped on board, and there's a virtual international U21 competition. Um, it functions at all three levels. It's also huge in the Northern Hemisphere. Canada has it, the UK has it. Because of the timing of the academic years, it's very hard to have a genuinely international competition, but U21 does a pretty good job. We're gonna start with a welcome few words from Professor Peter McPhee. Peter not only donated this wonderful trophy, but has been associated with the competition for pretty much since its existence. He was the first provost of the university. He's a professor, professorial fellow at the Melbourne Centre for the Study of Higher Education, who currently hosts the competition. And it's just basically one of the best lecturers on campus, Peter McPhee. <laughs> oh dear, with introductions like that. But I'm delighted to join with Simon in welcoming you to what I think is one of the great occasions um, in the academic year of the, the University of Melbourne. This university, of course, is justifiably proud uh, about the range and depth of the research that happens uh, in this university. And fundamental to that uh, research program, that research culture, is the work of our research higher degree students. Uh, this is a way this afternoon, uh, among other things, of showcasing uh, some of that work but it's uh, work of enormously high quality. I think we'd all agree about the desirability of uh, research higher degree students being able to articulate in just three minutes some of the basic ideas that they're working on uh, in, in words that are intelligible to a non-specialist audience. I think that's a, it's a huge challenge, but a very admirable one that they've, they've risen to. But I think uh, there are other benefits as well. I mean, I think that the very process of uh, having to think through now, what would I say in three minutes and how would I say that, actually has some significant benefits for the whole writing process generally. Uh, having to think through what's really significant about what I'm doing and how would I express that in a captivating way. I also think that the, the whole endeavour that involves so many people across so many weeks, as Simon said, um, really underscores the importance of the research culture in a place like this. That even though we have uh, scores of different academic disciplines, uh, the fact that we're able to communicate with each other and try and, and comprehend what people are doing, I think says a lot about research culture uh, in general. I happen to have the office next door to the classroom where the, the heats and the semi-finals of this competition occurred. I have an idea, therefore, of just how many people have been involved. Uh, I think we should be very grateful to Simon and his colleagues for the work that's gone into organising this. But I've been aware as well of just how many uh, thesis students have been through this process. Now, they've all benefited one, one way or another of, from, from being involved. So this is the culmination of uh, a great deal of work and, and intellectual energy. And I know you're all going to enjoy it just as much as I am. Thank you.
Now, we're going to introduce our judges. Judging this is an, uh, is an incredibly hard task. I've judged all the heats and semis so far, and I get to take my hands off the wheel and rest. Um, we have four incredibly able judges, starting with Nadine Davidoff. Now, when I teach, I always say that editing is 51% of the process and writing is only 49%. There's a writer sitting next to us, so I won't say that. Nadine Davidoff is a um, commercial editor who has worked with places like Random House with Black Ink. She also teaches fiction editing at the University of Melbourne here. She's hugely in demand and one of the best editors in town. Next to her, Jennifer Kloster, who many, many, many years ago when she was but a wee girl, did the very first workshop which became the Writing Centre, which became the Engagement Lab, which becomes the organisation hosting this. Jennifer took her PhD thesis, turned some of it into a book, that book was published by a random UK, Canada, USA, New Zealand, and finally Australia. Second book came out of that. The highlight of her life, the book was about the writer Georgette Heyer, and the highlight of Jennifer's life was standing next to Stephen Fry as they unveiled the blue plaque on her house. Everything else just pales into insignificance. She's written two young adult books since then and is currently working on her latest book due in 2019. Sarah Brooker, we have known each other for decades. Well, I mean, yes. From Science in Public, who are one of those interesting little niche organisations who work on so many projects around Melbourne, promoting science, science communication, which is so incredibly important. The most relevant and important, which today is Fresh Science. Fresh Science is a festival, a celebration of young scientists with amazing discoveries. Um, there's lots of information, information about it up there, and they are partnered with Unimelp. So Sarah from Fresh Science, incredibly important. And last, but by not least, on this very spot last year, a certain young speech pathologist from the Melbourne Centre of Study of Higher Education and a lecturer there happened to give a talk about youth justice and just happened to win, Nathaniel Swain. We've introduced a bit of a rule now that we get our winner back to judge the next lot. You know, it's a nice little cycle. Um, so thank you, judges, for doing a great job. While Nathaniel is here, I should also mention that I'm pretty sure in the audience somewhere is the very, very first winner of the Unimelb competition all those years ago. Hussein, are you here? Well done. <laughs> just, um, just to show you what the journey this starts is that Hussein now hangs around at some minor college in the state. Was it Harvard, was it? Harvard, yes. He's doing all right. Okay, we will quickly whiz through the rules, which I'm sure everyone who's seen this before know. It's three minutes. It is not a second more. The one sound you don't want to hear, Dina, is... If you hear that and you're still talking, it's thank you very much and good night. It's a single PowerPoint slide, no, anim no animation, no transitions, nothing fancy embedded, no video, no sound, no props, no costumes, no singing, no dancing, no rapping. It's essentially the power of you as a communicator. So while your research is obviously incredibly important, it's how you tell us about your research is what we're looking at. The criteria um, are quite long and complicated. Essentially, it's what you say and how you say it. So the story that you tell, the big picture focusing in on your research and then looking towards the future and where it might go next, and the way you present it, the, you know, the, the style that you use, how well the slide helps you with your communication skills. Those two areas get a mark out of 10. Those marks are totaled. The four judges are totaled in the secret room at the back, and that's how we get a winner. It's no secret. The prizes are worth aiming for. Four grand for the winner of research travel, 1,000 for the runner-up, and there is a People's Choice Award from the co-op, which we'll talk about um, when we do the prizes at the end. Interestingly, the person who wins Melbourne goes on to Queensland, and if you go to Queensland to the Asia Pacific, you could win five, you could win two grand if you're second, and there's a thousand for the People's Choice there. And of course, if you win Asia Pacific, you also get put on a plane and sent to Berlin to the Falling Walls Convention, which is probably the best um, you know, academic communication thing you could possibly go to. That's it, it's very simple. We are being filmed, we're being streamed live. Um, if anyone is uncomfortable with being filmed, just let us know and we'll take all the cameras and the lights down and we'll, we'll just start again. Um, there are millions of people out there. You will all get a chance to vote. So pay careful attention. Not only are the judges going to decide who's going to win, but you will have a chance to do the People's Choice Award at the end of it. So pay careful attention. All right, now this is what it's all about. We're going to have our competitors, and I will read, just to make sure I get this right. We drew the numbers at random, so there's no favoritism shown. Our very first um, contestant is Erica Wynne-Jones. 
She grew up living in many different small towns in Queensland, completed her undergraduate studies at James Cook in Townsville, studying tropical infectious diseases. From there, she completed honours at the Australian National University, looking at the herpes virus. She's now a third-year PhD student at the Peter Doherty Institute, studying the immune system. Today, she's going to talk to you about her PhD work with a talk entitled Immunity at the Front Line. Would you please welcome Erica Wynne-Jones. So you know that horrible feeling when you're in a really crowded place and then somebody sneezes next to you? You can feel the air rushing on your neck and the tiny droplets landing on your skin. And you can hold your breath, but you know that you've probably just inhaled some sort of pathogen, like a virus or bacteria. It's going to take a number of days for your immune system to recognize that pathogen and then generate enough specific cells to eliminate it. But after the infection has resolved, many of those specific cells will die because they aren't needed anymore. But some of them survive, and these are called memory cells, because they still have the ability to remember that pathogen and then protect you against it in the future. Some memory cells go into the circulation, so they can travel throughout the body. And this is how you can get a vaccine in your arm and then expect it to protect you somewhere else in the body. But we don't have effective vaccines for every disease. That sneeze might be carrying something much worse than the common cold. So we need to start thinking about different aspects of this memory response. Some memory cells actually stay at the site where you were infected. These are called resident memory cells, and they're the cells that I work on. The cool thing about these cells is that they form a sort of barrier to infection, so that the next time you encounter that pathogen, you don't have to wait for the circulating cells to get back to the site where it's invading, because the resident memory cells are already there. Now, I really want to know which instructions these cells receive. So what tells them to become a cell that stays in the tissue, as opposed to a cell that circulates throughout the body? And to do this, I look at their genes, because genes are essentially instruction manuals for cells. During my PhD, I've been focusing on a particular gene called TBET. And if we want to know what the function of a specific gene is, all we have to do is see what happens when it's missing. So I isolated immune cells from various tissue samples after the TBET gene had been removed. And I ran these cells through a fax machine. It's probably not the kind of fax machine you're thinking of but I used it to figure out how many resident memory cells were present in each different tissue. When I looked in the liver, I found barely any resident memory cells, showing that that TBET gene is really critical for the liver resident memory cells to develop. But then when I looked in the gut, I found the complete opposite. There were more resident memory cells, and they persisted for a really long time. They don't seem to need the TBET gene at all. And then in the skin, I found something kind of in the middle. Initially, there were more resident memory cells, but then they died over time. So instead, they need the TBET gene for survival. Researchers around the world are now trying to use resident memory cells to generate better vaccines and treatments for certain cancers and autoimmune diseases. But my work shows that we can't just broadly study these cells. We need to know what's happening in each individual organ to make these treatments and vaccines effective so that the next time somebody sneezes next to you, you might be able to breathe a little bit easier. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Contestant number two is Josh, Joshua Newson. Josh is originally from the small country town of Kurikuri in New South Wales. He did his undergrad at bio, in biotechnology at the University of Newcastle, where his honours work was focused on how drug-resistant bacteria regulate their own DNA. He's now based at the Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity here at the University of Melbourne, where his PhD research looks at how infectious bacteria manipulate and control our immune cells. Today's talk on his thesis is entitled Bacteria versus the Cell. Would you welcome, please, Josh Newson? Every day, your body is under attack by infectious bacteria, as well as viruses and other threats that are so small you can't even see them. Your body defends itself by sending immune cells to kill these invaders. This is cellular warfare. It's a microscopic conflict, but the stakes are very high. If your immune cells can't kill these bacteria, then they are free to grow and spread and cause disease. I am fascinated by this conflict, and I want to understand why some bacteria are able to survive their encounter with a killer immune cell. 
And it's a bit like a Trojan horse, because these bacteria, they wait until they've been swallowed by an immune cell. And then, when they're on the inside, that's when they launch their attack. That's when they start to hijack the cell. To do this, these bacteria use tiny needles to inject their own bacterial proteins into the infected immune cell. Now, the inside of a human immune cell is like a finely tuned machine. And when these bacterial proteins get in there, they can cause a lot of damage. My job is to figure out exactly what these bacterial proteins are doing to the immune cell during infection. If we can do this, we can come up with new ways to treat bacterial infections. So I spend my days growing infectious bacteria, I expose them to immune cells, and then I watch as the infection unfolds. I use powerful microscopes to see the bacteria inside the infected cell and to capture a snapshot of this battle, which you can see behind me. But I also look to see how the cell changes, both physically and biochemically, as a result of the infection. What I've discovered is that these bacteria are injecting their proteins into the infected immune cell in order to disrupt some important cell signaling proteins. Now your immune cells would normally use these cell signaling proteins to call for help to recruit other immune cells to the site of infection. These same cell signaling proteins are also involved in a process called cell death, which allows an infected cell to sacrifice itself, bursting apart to release all of the bacteria that it contains. I think these bacteria are shutting down cell signaling so that they get to stay safely inside the infected cell where they want to be. Now this is important because if we can find ways to disrupt what the bacteria are doing, we might be able to help our immune cells respond to this infection. And we do need new ways to treat bacterial infections. Antibiotic resistance is increasing and every time we use an antibiotic, we are encouraging the bacteria to become resistant to it. So if we can find new ways not to kill bacteria, but to interfere with how they cause an infection, that would be very powerful. My challenge now is to figure out exactly how these signaling pathways are impacted. If we can do this, we might be able to help tip the balance of this conflict and resolve it in our favour. Thank you. Two minutes and 59 is a very good use of your three minutes. <laughs> Just don't do it again. Our third finalist is Solange Glasser. Solange began her tertiary education by studying violin performance musicology at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music. Quickly understanding that she was more comfortable with a book in hand than a bow, she published her honours thesis under the title Music, the Brain and Amusia, the first of her explorations into the newer mechanisms of music and creativity. She then made the difficult decision to move to the land of wine, cheese and pastries, spending over a decade in Paris, where she completed a bachelor and master's degrees at the Sorbonne. From the most beautiful city in the world, she switched to the most livable city in the world four years ago, before Metro Rail, where she is currently in her final year of PhD in music psychology at the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. Never wandering far from the brain, however, she's currently investigating the impact of specific neurological conditions on musical abilities. Her discussion with you today is entitled More Than Meets the Ear. Would you please welcome Solange Glasser. Every time I have given a presentation of my research, at least one audience member has found out that they have a rare neurological condition. Anxious? <laughs> well, don't be. You see, I am studying a condition called synesthesia, where two or more senses are joined in an automatic and involuntary way. For example, some people with synesthesia, called synesthetes, see colours when they hear music. Before embarking on my doctoral journey, I was accosted at a conference by a gentleman who rolled my name around in his mouth, Solange, before pronouncing gingery, rather pleasant. <laughs> now, tasting words greatly impacts his life, and as a music psychologist, this encounter made me question how having synesthesia could influence musical development. Now, synesthesia is linked to heightened memory and creativity. But to my great surprise, none of this research involved music. I decided to break this silence by interviewing synesthetes here 
next door at the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music. I diagnosed and interviewed 17 synesthetes, and this was no small task. You see, synesthesia occurs in around 4% of the general population, but of this number, only one in five cases involves music. What's more, many of my participants were unaware that they even had synesthesia before hearing my recruitment speech. Instead, thinking that the way they experienced music was normal. What I found was that none of my participants experienced music in the same way. For Mason, E major is yellow and tastes like mango. But Charlotte refuses to listen to the saxophone, which produces a horrible bright yellow colour that hurts. What intrigued me was that many of these effects were subconscious. I asked Thomas how having synesthesia influenced his musical preferences. He paused, mentally running through his iTunes playlist, as he came to the startling realisation that the majority of his downloads were blue. <laughs> These diverse descriptions indicate that we still have much to learn about each of our unique interpretations of our lived experiences. Yes, we hear with our ears, but we hear with our brains as well. Synesthesia is more than meets the ear and reveals how we all, not just perceive, but also generate the world around us. You will all know someone with synesthesia, but you probably don't know who. Perhaps more surprising, that person might be you. Thank you. Our next finalist is Jennifer Keller. Jennifer studied Bachelor and Honours in Biomedical Science at the University of Queensland. She's currently a second year PhD student in the Laboratory for Resp Respiratory and Neuroscience. Focus on respiratory diseases with particular interest in chronic cough. Currently, the field is facing a major issue with translating res basic research into effective cough medications. Jenny's PhD project is taking a novel approach to this problem, but making a new respiratory model using human cells. Would you please welcome Jennifer Keller? When was the last time you coughed? Most of you probably can't remember. I cough every single day without fail. Some days it's just irritating. Other days it feels like all the air has been squeezed out of my lungs and I can't breathe. This isn't just my reality, with around two and a half million Australians suffering from chronic cough. So why can't we just use medication to alleviate it? Current drugs, including the ones I take, are generally ineffective. This is because cough is a spectrum with the underlying cause different in each patient group. In other words, what drives excessive coughing in asthmatics, such as myself, will differ from bronchitis or allergies. Therefore, to develop better drugs, we need to identify how cough changes in a disease-specific manner. But first, how is this reflex produced? Cough is mediated by communication between the lungs and the brain via the nervous system. Our lungs contain these specialized nerve cells that detect when we inhale anything nasty and send signals to the brain. Cough is not evoked to protect our lungs. However, in respiratory diseases, this nerve lung communication changes and the nerves become overexcited. We don't know the exact mechanisms that drive this change since it can't be studied in humans at the cellular level. That's where my PhD research comes in. I'm developing a human respiratory model to investigate how nerves communicate with a specific type of lung cell called epithelial cells. So first, we need to obtain human cells. Fortunately, epithelial cells can be sampled directly from patients by taking a simple nasal swab. Nerve cells cannot be taken from patients, but I can make them in the lab with tissue engineering. So these cell types alone don't spontaneously form a functioning organ. But with the right conditions, we can create 3D structures that resemble organs on the microscopic scale. 
For example, the epithelial tissues I create in the lab secrete mucus like they would in the lungs. This is pretty incredible. The challenge is to get the engineered nerve cells to grow and connect with the epithelial tissue so that I can study their communication. I've developed and I'm currently testing several ways to achieve this. Once optimized, this model has incredible possibilities. By substituting healthy epithelial samples with diseased ones, we can identify the specific factors driving nerve overexcitability within this entire cough spectrum. Therefore, my research is paving the way for developing more individualized cough treatments. But the best part is, I'm fighting the disease that's left me breathless for over 20 years. Thank you, Jennifer. Next, we have Catriona Nguyen Robertson, who was Melbourne born and bred. She undertook a Bachelor of Science majoring in immunology and a diploma in languages at the University of Melbourne before beginning her PhD in the same field. Outside of her PhD studies, she enjoys teaching science and singing. After a personal encounter with spray on sunscreen, Catriona will be talking about when sunscreens sting. Would you please welcome Catriona Nguyen Robertson? Slip, slop, slap. That is what we're told every summer to stay sun smart. But since the introduction of spray on sunscreens, an alarming number of people have been hospitalized due to their allergic reactions to them. I myself was victim. My face and arms were covered in rashes for months. That is me, and this is my story. I want to know why some sunscreens cause allergic reactions and how we can stop them. I study the immune system. More specifically, I study T cells, one of the main drivers in defense against infection. They act like security guards, patrolling the body to assess whether the contents of our cells are self or non-self. If they detect non-self, such as an invading bacteria or virus, they become activated and either go in for the kill or sound the alarm to the rest of the immune system. Sometimes there can be false alarms and this can lead to allergy. With this in mind, I study T cells that interact with the skin. To do this, I isolate them from human blood and skin samples using a cell sorter that takes the cells that I want and leaves the cells that I don't want. The cell sorter can also be used to test whether or not these T cells are activated. To learn how T cells function in the body, I assess their interactions with different types of cells, including other immune cells, skin cells, and bacteria. Interestingly, some T cells that are activated by bacteria, which is what you want, are also activated by our own cells. And this shows us that T cells don't always get the line between self and non-self quite right. In fact, the allergic response to bee stings is actually due to T cells attacking the oils in your skin. These are changed slightly due to the presence of the bee venom and therefore perceived as a threat and attacked. Going back to the sunscreen story, I'm testing the ingredients of different sunscreens to find out what activates T cells and therefore causes allergy. While I can't lather sunscreen on people to see whether or not they develop a rash, I can test different ingredients to see whether or not they activate T cells in a dish. It is important to know whether the allergy is caused by T cells attacking our own skin, a component of the sunscreen, or a combination of both if the sunscreen somehow changes our skin oils like the bee venom does. So far, I have found some ingredients of sunscreens that may indeed activate T cells. There are also oils found naturally in our skin that can activate T cells too. Now that we know the T cell targets, we can learn how they attack and how we can stop them so that you and I don't have to suffer for being sun smart and we can happily slip, slop, slap. Thank you, Katrina. We're halfway through and I'm sure not only would you agree that we're in the company of some amazing communicators, but that none of us would swap places with the judges for anything. Contestant participant number six, Meng Jie Hu. Close. 
we've been, we spent a long time doing. You know? Meng Jiahu grew up in a small city in the south of China. In 2008, she decided to come to Australia to complete a Bachelor of Science, majoring in biochemistry, followed by a Master's of Biomedical Science. She's currently doing her PhD research focusing on host virus interactions. In the long term, she hopes to contribute to the advancement of treatments and cures for disease. In the short term, she hopes to make you as passionate about her research as she is. The title of Meng Jie's talk is Let Babies Breathe, Finding Weapons Against RSV. Would you please welcome Meng Jie Hu. Why do thousands of Australian babies struggle to breathe each year? Because of RSV. Three simple letters that the parents of a young child are horrified to hear. RSV is respiratory syncytial virus, a virus much like the flu virus that infects our lungs. But RSV is much more dangerous. It is the number one cause of severe lung infection that results in almost 200,000 infant deaths each year around the world. In Australia alone, 5,000 infected babies were admitted to hospitals in winter of 2015. And each year, RSV infection costs $50 million in healthcare. Our infected babies are currently at the mercy of the virus. And there's little we can do to help. We are in desperate need of a treatment. However, first, we need to understand more about this virus. The virus already knows plenty about us. It knows exactly when, where, and what to attack to maximize its growth and survival. We need to strike back. But would you fight a battle without knowing the weakness of your enemies? Of course not. So my research project is about understanding this virus and finding its weakness. And I think I have found it. I am studying the impact of, of RSV infection on cells mitochondrial, the cellular factories that provide energy to every cell of our bodies. My results show that the infected lung cells have much lower energy production than the non-infected cells meaning that the virus is causing a failure into the cell's energy factories. No wonder that our infected babies are struggling to breathe. By using cells that have broken energy factories, I'm seeing for the first time that virus production is increased. This means that virus gains strength in its battle by attacking the cell's energy factories. Now, this is vital information because now we can change our battle strategy to short circuit this to weaken the virus attack. Even better, I've already found some promising drugs that can help the cells to repel the energy factories and prevent RSV growth. My next step is to investigate how RSV attacks our energy system and use this knowledge to explore new targets for drugs to treat RSV infection. With this new information, we will develop robust weapons to win this battle against RSV and let our babies breathe again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Jessica Tang. Jessica is a junior doctor from Sydney who has taken time off the wards for a full-time study on an eye disease called glaucoma. Her goal at the end of her research is to improve the way glaucoma is monitored and managed so that we can stop vision loss, hence the title of her talk today, Keeping a Better Eye on Glaucoma. Would you please welcome Jessica Tang. I'd like you all to cover one eye and concentrate on the red cross in the centre of the screen. Now, without moving your eye or turning your head, you'll also notice a black bar on the right-hand corner of the screen. What we've just tested is your peripheral field of view, a key part of our vision that allows us to walk without bumping into objects and to drive without bumping into cars and pedestrians. And it's peripheral vision that is gradually lost in patients with glaucoma. Glaucoma is a condition where the nerve that connects the eye to the brain is progressively damaged, and if left untreated, can lead to vision impairment and eventually blindness. 
Now, the main way we monitor glaucoma and ensure that treatment is working is with a visual field test, similar in principle to what we just did. The problem is that it's far from a perfect test because for it to be accurate, you really need to be able to concentrate for 10 to 15 minutes on a central point and to click a button every time you see a stimulus in your periphery. Now you can imagine how hard this might be for a patient who's elderly, tired, or just really stressed about their condition to do well. And because it's so inherently subjective, it actually takes at least 12 months of frequent testing to tell if treatment is saving vision. Now for my patient John, who in the last two years has struggled to do a field test reliably, by the time we picked up that his glaucoma was getting worse, the damage was already done. And sadly, he's not alone. In fact, one in eight Australians over 80 will develop glaucoma, and many will lose parts of their vision unnecessarily because we don't have a better test. But that's where I hope my research will make a difference. Because instead of subjectively measuring how well patients see, as we do currently, I'm investigating a portable device called an electroretinogram, or ERG, to directly and objectively measure how well the nerve itself is working. And the concept is simple. In response to flashes of light, electrical signals travel along the nerve to the brain, and the ERG picks this up automatically with electrodes placed near the eye. A damaged nerve sends a small signal, while nerve that has recovered after treatment will deliver a bigger one. Using the ERG, I've been able to measure signal changes in patients as soon as one month after their treatment, and this is before any changes are detected on the visual field. My objective now is to follow these patients over the next 12 months to see if this initial ERG signature can predict what will happen to their vision in the longer term. If proven, we'll be able to use the ERG to detect which patients are not responding to treatment and intervene sooner. And because the device is portable, simple to use and well tolerated by patients, we'll be able to take this research to the 300,000 Australians like John suffering from glaucoma and stop further vision loss. With this research, we're one step closer to keeping a better eye on glaucoma. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have Amanda Kwong. After completing her undergraduate degree in physiotherapy with the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences at the University of Melbourne, Amanda has returned eight years later to complete her PhD with the same school. She works clinically at the Royal Women's Hospital as a physiotherapist for children and is currently researching a novel smartphone app to facilitate screening for movement problems and cerebral palsy in extremely premature babies. Her talk today about her PhD is entitled Move Baby Move. Would you please welcome Amanda Kwong. Three minutes. It's enough time to talk about an entire PhD, but it's also enough time for a baby to give us a glimpse into their future. For my PhD, I'm studying babies who are born extremely premature. That's those who are born three to four months too early. What's most concerning about these tiny babies is that one in six will end up having cerebral palsy. This is a brain injury that results in a permanent physical disability. And we're catching cerebral palsy too late at around 13 months of age. By then, we miss the golden opportunity where babies' brains are like sponges and they really soak up all the exercises that we give them through an early intervention program. So my team decided to try and catch these babies earlier. We know that when babies are around three months of age, they start to show normal flickers of movement through their body which we call fidgety movements. If you don't see fidgety movements, it can be predictive of cerebral palsy. And the window to see these movements is so narrow that we end up missing some babies at this time. But most people have smartphones these days. So my PhD will find out if we can partner with parents and get them to use a smartphone app called Baby Moves to take a three minute video of their baby at this critical point in time. With a click of a button, the app compresses and sends videos to a central secure database. And from here, I'm scoring the quality of over 400 videos because health professionals, like myself, can't assess babies' movements if they're crying, wearing clothes, or their hands and feet aren't in view. And for those who do have concerning movements, 
I'm getting parents to bring their babies in for a face-to-face -face physical assessment so I can tell if these videos can truly identify those babies who are showing movement problems or even early signs of cerebral palsy right when babies need to start early intervention. And while I think it's awesome that I get to watch cute baby videos all day, it's also important to find out how usable the app is. So I'm surveying parents to see what they think. So far, they're telling me it's convenient to video their babies again and again without having to attend multiple appointments. This is a game changer, especially if you're geographically or socially isolated. With this smartphone app, we can screen more babies earlier for movement problems. We can enrich these babies so that they can reach their full potential. So while my three minutes is nearly up, think about what three minutes could do for a baby born extremely premature. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Contestant number nine, Gerardo Luis de Maguia. Gerardo did his Bachelor of Computer Science at the Ateneo de Zamboanga University in the southern Philippines, which he likes to call Philippines Down Under. He's extremely grateful to have been supported by Australia's Endeavour Scholarship to do his Master of IT with a health specialisation, and now by the Melbourne Research Scholarships and Newman College to do his PhD. As a PhD candidate from the Health and Biomedical Informatics Centre, he's developing a tool to measure the effects of using health data that we ourselves generate. The title of his talk today from his PhD thesis is called Making Clinical Use of Our Health Data. Would you please welcome Gerardo Luis de Maguia. Do you know when you last generated health data? Was it when you used Fitbit to track your steps or sleep? How about using an app to track calories burned after cycling? Those are your health data, and many of you would have recently generated them. Now let me ask you, what did you do with those health data? Have you ever showed them to your doctor, who then used them to assess your health and prescribe an appropriate treatment or a health plan? Chances are, if you did show your doctor, he or she would have ignored the data you presented. This is because those are not clinical or data collected by health professionals. And there's currently no way for us to clinically measure the effects of people using their health data. When I first realized this, I was astonished. This is because in controlled studies, patients using their health data has been shown to have positive effects, like increased engagement with their health recovery and improved coordination with their healthcare teams. However, Without a way for us to clinically measure and understand the effects of people using their health data, we can't normalize those benefits for all of us who generate and use health data. Well, that's the hurdle my research is trying to overcome. I'm developing a clinical tool that measures the effects of using person-generated health data. To develop this tool, I needed to combine IT user experience measures and clinical patient-reported outcome measures into a new tool that measures the effects of using health data. I analyzed more than a dozen of these measures, such as system usability questionnaires and quality of life scales, to select items that match my objectives. To refine and validate this new tool, I'm working with health professionals to conduct focus groups in Australia and the Philippines. And while I'm starting with stroke patients, because stroke is a leading cause of death and disability around the world, this new tool could later be expanded for other conditions and consumer devices. At the end of my PhD, I would have developed an evidence-based tool that measures the effects of using person-generated health data. This new tool, which may be in the form of a computer software or a mobile app, can enhance our use of health technologies. We can use it to generate understanding of how using our health data affects us and help our doctors use those data as well. Health technology providers could use the tool to assess the impact of their existing health data generating devices or applications and guide their launching of a new intervention. Ultimately, my hope is that unused person-generated health data would be a thing of the past. So let's work towards a world where our health data would be as easily usable as a Fitbit.
Thank you, Gerardo. And our last of the 10 competitors today is Ali Akhiri. Ali accomplished his bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering in Iran. He then received two scholarships from the University of Melbourne to pursue a PhD in mechanical engineering, studying sound generation by turbulent premixed flames using numerical simulations and high performance computing. His talk today from his PhD thesis is entitled Mechanism of Noise Generation by Flames. Would you please welcome Ali Hakiri. Noise is unwelcome in many applications across the transport, power generation, and industrial sectors. International Civil Aviation Organization predicts that air transportation may be doubled worldwide by 2025, making noise pollution a serious global issue due to its adverse impact on health and quality of life. In a modern aircraft engine, different components contribute to the noise generation. Amongst them, the noise generated by the flame inside the combustion chamber is a significant source of combustion noise. In addition, this generated noise can lead to resonance that can shake the engine apart. Hence, detailed understanding of combustion noise is crucial for designing quieter and safer combustion systems. However, in spite of decades of research on this subject, the question remains, what exactly is the mechanism of noise generation by flames? The purpose of my research is therefore to answer this question using direct numerical simulations where all relevant flow physics are fully resolved in the simulation. And I can examine every detail of the flame for source of the noise. Just like in medicine, you have to diagnose the disease before you can treat it. However, such numerical studies are computationally very intensive. That's why I've taken the advantage of one of the most powerful supercomputers in the Southern Hemisphere, which is fortunate in Australia, and I ran my simulations on about 10,000 computational cores and generating nearly 200 terabytes of data. To give you an idea about the size of my simulation, if I was able to run this simulation on my personal computer, it would take approximately 400 years. <laughs> my study is the first of its kind in simulating the flame and the sound field simultaneously with high numerical resolution, whereby the mechanism of noise generation by flames could be discovered. I found that flame annihilation events are significant source of combustion noise. Flame annihilation occurs when two flame fronts collide, leading to a rapid change in the rate of heat produced by the flame, and the noise is generated as a result. I've also classified these events based on their topologies and proposed a model that relates these events to the sound measured in the far field. The outcomes of my PhD research have important applications in modern gas turbine industries as well as in industrial engineering. Since it can enable devices that pollute less, so benefit humans, animals, and the environment more broadly. Thank you. What we're gonna do first of all, Ali, come back. I want the first, the 10 of you in the front row to stand up, turn around. And let's just give a huge round of applause to these amazing people. Now, if you're trying to, trying to choose the winner, it's a bit like betting on a horse race with 10 favorites, I think. What we're going to do now is take the judges off, Dina, will you take, take the judges off to the secret soundproof sealed room where they will deliberate. While they're deliberating, you also get a chance to choose. Up on the screen here is the address for SurveyMonkey, which we're using for our people's choice. And people watching the live stream as well, SurveyMonkey is open to you at the moment. Choose your favorite, choose the person you thought communicated their research in the best way. We will take a five, ten minute break while we total up the judges scores and allow you to vote and then we will come back and we will award the prizes.
Okay, we're closing the survey in three, two, one. Okay. 380 people voted. Yeah. Okay, we'll announce the people's choice after our first and second prize winners. First of all, though, everyone is going to get a certificate of participation, congratulations, and a gift card from the co-op. Now, sponsorship is very important. Sponsorship has to work for it to continue, and without sponsorship, events like this can't happen. The co-op, located in Stop 1 at the corner of Grattan and Swanson Streets is a sponsor of this event. They have given us the People's Choice Prize. We also have co-op vouchers. I would like everyone to go to the co-op in the next week, please, and say thank you very much for sponsoring 3MT. If we annoy their staff enough, they will understand the impact that the sponsorship makes. So it's very important. We would love to thank the co-op. Mary, thank you very much. You've been very nice to us. One last... Okay, it's the same as last year. We have a tie. I think we should open for 30 seconds. We're going to open the Survey Monkey for 30 seconds. If anyone hasn't voted, if anyone is out there in streaming land, you have 30 seconds to influence, to significantly influence the outcome. This happened last year. Okay, it's open again. We have 30 seconds. Okay, it's closed again and we have a winner. <sighs> First of all, however, let's have one last round of applause as we give our certificates and, and co-op gift cards to Erica Wynne-Jones. Come on up. Congratulations. Well done. Josh Newson. Congratulations. Solange Glasser. Congratulations. Jennifer Keller. Well done. Catriona Nguyen Robertson. Well done. Meng Jie Hu. Well done. Jessica Tang. Congratulations. Amanda Kwong. Thank you very much. Gerardo Luis de Maguia. Congratulations. And Ali Hagiri. Congratulations. Okay, we're going to announce second prize first, and then first prize, and then the people's choice. We got the check? Or? Second prize, would you please give a huge round of applause to Solange Glasser. <laughs> well done, congratulations.
and the Peter McPhee cup and an endless supply of champagne to drink from it. <laughs> Goes to our first place winner, Jessica Tang. And I'm going to get Mary from the co-op to bring the goodies up. We have a Garmin, and we have some headphones, some audio technica, courtesy of the co-op. Don't forget to go down there, harass them. <laughs> People's Choice winner voted on is Meng Jie Hu. Okay, what happens next is our winner goes on to Queensland to uh, an amazing event with 50 other or 49 other competitors from around the country. We then record them in a special three minute recording for the U21 competition. And we thank you for coming today. We hope to see you here this time next year at some of the heats at the final. The dates for U21 are in October. Aha. Uh -huh. And we hope to see you here next year. So thanks for coming. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. And we'd love you to join us for afternoon tea afterwards to celebrate. <laughs>